Good morning. Well, thank you all for attending my lecture. And th thanks particularly to the organizers of the conference, John Pierce, uh, to blame mainly for inviting me here. Well, Paris is the dreamland of <laughs> narratology. And there are stories everywhere, but uh, there are many more stories in Paris. There are, there's, there's something I've always wanted to say in Paris. Uh, innombrables sont les récits du monde. Hmm? The narratives of the world are numberless. Yet all stories may be seen as chapters of a single story. Evolutionary approaches to literary and cultural phenomena by E. O. Wilson, Joseph Carroll, recently have led to a growing awareness that these literary and cultural phenomena are best accounted for within a consilient disciplinary framework. From this consilient standpoint, human modes of communication must be contextualized as situated historical phenomena, and history as such is to be placed within the wider context of the evolution of human societies and of life generally, what is often called big history, these days after David Christian. Hmm? Using the notions of narrative mapping and narrative anchoring, the, the present lecture aims to draw from the aforementioned theoretical outlook a series of conclusions relevant to narratology, in particular to the narratological conceptualization of time. Diverse cultural conceptions of big history, it's not been invented now, underpin the production, the reception, and the critical analysis of, of any specific narrative, as well as any narrativizing strategy, in the sense that these conceptions provide both a general ideational background to the experiences depicted in the narratives, experience of the characters, and a mental framework in which to situate or historicize the narrative genres used in the depiction. I'll use Herbert Spencer's philosophical work, seeing it through the lens of its narratological significance, as a significant contribution in the development of our own big history, the West and the modernity, in the narrativization of science and in the development of a scientific narratology. I refer to some quotations from basically from Herbert Spencer in, in your handout. Narratology was born with an aspiration, scientific aspiration to universality in Aristotle's poetics. Philosophy as a knowledge of universals is contrasted to history as a knowledge of individual facts. Any opposition seems to call for a synthesis or mediation, and Aristotle suggested one in his theory of poetry. Poetry is more philosophical than history because it imposes a conceptual order or pattern on the events of human experience and action. The poetics offers a foundational model for narratology. It is the first formal narratological treatise besides much else. But in addition to the structural analysis of plot, of discovery, of closure, or of structure, it also contains some pointers re relating to the origin of drama or of mimetic art generally, grounding it on the imitative instincts in human nature. And it can also lay claim, therefore, to taking precedence as the first treatise in cognitive poetics. Paul Ricoeur pointed out the cognitive importance of emplotment, as first conceived by Aristotle. Emplotment, organizing events into a story, paving the road to a closure, is a prime cognitive move, equal at least in importance to the joining of subject and predicate in a proposition, or to metaphor which, as Giambattista Vico pointed out, stands at the root of creative thought. There is, of course, a chapter on metaphor in the poetics, although the main emphasis falls on the analysis of the structure of plot. Emplotment and narrativity allow us to see or to establish the connection in a series of events. Most post-structuralist criticism has been suspicious of such uh, connections and has deconstructed narrative causality and the unities built by master plotters. As an instance of such criticism, I'd like to mention Gary Saul Morrison's Narrative and Freedom, a masterful critique of several ills attending the retrospective stance of narrative, and a major contribution to the analysis of hindsight bias. Although this term is not used in the book, he calls it backshadowing. Hmm? Hindsight bias is the narrative fallacy par excellence 
although one might go one step further and argue that narrative is the narrative fallacy par excellence. So entwined with distortions and with, with illusions are the truths we articulate and the stories we tell, with facts, fictions, omissions, and additions being present in almost equal proportions though not in the same way in, in fictional stories and in historical or biographical records. Unity and unity finders have been much disparaged since the 1960s, although they no doubt tell part of the truth in the story. Nietzsche's aphorisms and his hermeneutics of suspicion have been much preferred to the grand philosophical systematics of Hegel, which are largely left unread, at least outside the philosophical field. But the work of unification, unfashionable like romantic fiction, goes on nonetheless with much work being done, the background behind the back of the, of the deconstructors, changing the very landscape in which we live and think. The unforeseen revolution of the internet, internet communications, hmm, unforeseen by the imagination of science fiction even, hmm, is a particularly relevant example the demise of the great narratives was one of the catchphrases of academia precisely at the time in which the great narratives of globalization, electronic communications, and relativistic cosmology were asserting their influence in an incontestable way. As my title suggests, I want to emphasize one such aspect of narrative, its inherent power to provide unification, to connect. In the last analysis, to connect all narratives in a cognitive step which makes sense of the whole of the world we live in. The term third culture has become widespread in recent years associated to E.O. Wilson's notion of consilience, building bridges between the humanities and the sciences on the basis of cognitive science, evolutionary psychology, and sociobiology. The accounts of big history that we find in books by David Christian or Fred Spear uh, provide histories of cosmic evolution. Inspired by Jan Smoot's concept of emergence, they set in a wider context the rise of life and of civilization and provide a scientific context which throws a much needed light on the present problems of human societies and cultures, especially in the light of the energy crisis, overpopulation, sustainability, and the depletion of the environment. These are the inescapable contexts of both present and future cultural investigations and representations. And these big histories make it clear that, that there is a human history, one human history, and a history of the universe, which is the inescapable backdrop to all the stories of mankind and the soil on which they grow. There are many directions one can take to go from the many stories to the principle of all stories. One such was the role taken by structuralist critics, the founding fathers of narratology, trying to find the common structural principles of stories, a grammar of stories or a semiotic system uh, accounting for all narratives. Both the Central and East European formalists in the early decades of the 20th century and the structuralists here in Paris from the 60s were retaking Aristotle's project all narratives answering to common structural principles. Myth criticism, as best exemplified in the work of Northrop Fry, undertook a similar project. And the insights provided from these perspectives can be use usefully rethought from a conciliant stance. Joseph Carroll's Darwinian Poetics or Brian Boyd's book on the origin of stories are only the, fir the first steps in this reassessment, which sometimes takes a rather contentious turn given that the sociobiological critics stress the limited flexibility of human nature, as against the claims of constructivist critics, which tend to see human nature as a blank slate for culture to, to write on. The sociobiological critics claim that human nature, for all its flexibility, is limited and circumscribed, and tied to our age-long heritage and evolutionary history. The big history is especially prominent from this stance, it weighs heavily on the shoulders of the naked ape, of the clothed ape also. Another, another way to synthesis, from the many to the one, and towards science, was provided in the 19th century by the philosophy of history, Hegel, and also by evolutionary phenomena as part of a single big history. Cultural theory, biology, uh, and geology, 
all became historical science, we might, we might say narrative sciences, in, in the 18th and 19th century. Chemistry, astronomy, and physics followed suit in the 20th century, resulting in the narrativization of the universe, no less. One of the earliest and most complex theories of evolution was formulated by Herbert Spencer 150 years ago. The first edition of his groundbreaking First Principles is from 1862, last revised by the author in 1900. It is somewhat ironic that Spencer is nowadays regarded frequently as a kind of epigone to, to, to Darwin, hmm? uh, given that his theory of evolution not only predated the publication of The Origin of Species in Social Statics, 1850, it is also much more complex and wide encompassing than Darwinism. It is a theory of the global evolution of the universe and its phenomena, not merely a theory of the evolution of living forms, although it certainly takes into account the, evo the evolution of living forms, hmm? for the details of which Spencer often refers to Darwin. Hmm? He goes much farther in trying to account for the generation of many phenomena at the physical mathematical level, at the cosmological level, and also at the level of geology, of biology, psychology, sociology, economics, and culture. Clearly, Spencer's conception of evolution is much more abstract and general than Darwin's, as it aims to explain a multitude of phenomena which were outside the scope of Darwinian biology. Actually, Darwin does not even address the origin of life, or nor venturing to, to, to write on the subject, being as he was too prudent, cautious, both in scientific terms and in terms of the possible damage to his social life and reputation. Darwin suggests that all living beings descend from one primeval living form, but he does not speculate on the origin of that being, only telling us in pseudo-biblical language that life was breathed into it. Darwinism addresses evolution understood as the formation of species and diverse varieties of living beings, Evolution means for Darwin, who does not much use the term evolution himself, it means descent with modification. And his celebrated principle of nat natural selection and the self-organizing emergence of complexity applies only to living beings. But many complex biological phenomena, such as consciousness, are not dealt with by Darwin either, while the evolution of consciousness is central for Spencer. Spencer's very definition of evolution is more encompassing and ambitious than Darwin's. You, you may read it in, in, uh, in your handout, number one. It is too ambitious, some have said. And you read the definition there, but I would summarize it as uh, he, he conceives of evolution as, as the development of complexity, we might say, in, in our, own, our own terms. This ties in with what John Pierce said uh, yesterday with, in his lecture about narrative and complexity. So evolution is the process whereby greater complexity is generated through the spontaneous integration of natural forces and phenomena. Some examples of this relative integration at various levels may be mentioned in number two in your handout, such as the formation of a planet out of dispersed matter, the formation of pluricellular beings out of unicellular beings, the formation of complex societies unifying dispersed populations, well, this is in Spencer, hmm? the integration of productive and economic systems in a global economy. I pose to say that this can only be accounted for through narrative, through the kind of storytelling which integrates diverse phenomena into a coherent stories of processes and development. And uh, some instances of the growing heterogeneity which goes along with these unifications, there's a double movement, hmm? heterogeneity, the formation of planets with different characteristics, a plurality of worlds in different positions in the solar system, the diverse forms of pluricellular beings and of anatomical structures as compared with the relative uniformity of single-celled organisms or the first hypothetical primeval organism, different modes of social life, different ecological economies exploiting a variety of natural resources and landscapes, the differentiation of social classes and professions in a nation, or the global division of work and the extreme specialization of production allowed by the development of communications, 
So although Spencer was not familiar with the internet or with GATS, the global village, the business niches of the long tail, etc., are only a corollary of this law of evolution. Once we acknowledge the growing generation of complexity and diversification. And he did not know the European Union either, but he announces it quite exp explicitly a century in advance in the mid-Victorian age based on the analysis of data and, uh, and of historical processes, hmm? and well before the idea had reached the thoughts of any politician. Spencer could not deal in any detail with the origin of life and consciousness, but he does situate them within the framework of this general theory of the evolution of complexity out of more basic components. It could be said that although in a more general sense any change including processes, processes of disintegration and disaggregation are part of evolution as well, Spencer considers the latter a contrary process. The growth of integrating and complexifying evolution in certain sections, limited sections of the universe, may be followed by dissolution, or this may be taking place elsewhere at the same time. This is the result of a tendency others have called entropy, a reduction in heterogeneity. Consciousness is, within the scope of Spencer's theory, a phenomenon which is possible only in the context of highly complex living processes resulting from high heterogeneity. The, this materialist and evolutionary theory of consciousness was developed some, some decades later by George Herbert Mead in The Philosophy of the Present. It is highly consonant with Spencer's thought and it is tempting to see each of these two theories of complexity in terms of one another. You've got some of the references at the end of the, uh, your, your handout, Herbert Mead, The Philosophy of the Present. <clears throat> this global integration of evolutionary processes resulting from what Mead would call the sociality of physical phenomena, and this notion of consciousness cannot but culminate in a philosophy of, of evolution which redefines itself and accounts for itself in such terms. Philosophy must needs be a process of integration, and being the highest activity of consciousness, philosophy must conceive of itself in these terms. It must develop an awareness of what it is. That is, what, the, the sta what is the status of philosophy considered in the light of overall evolutionary processes? And Spencer, like Hegel, must be forgiven if these reflections lead to a somewhat circular reflexivity, consciousness being essentially reflexive, or more immodestly to an aggrandizing of their own system within the scale of being. I, for one, will not question the accuracy of their self-assessments. William Wills' term consilience, Victorian term, revived of late by E.O. Wilson in his 19, 1998 book, Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge. Uh, this term is not used by Spencer, but he's as clear-sighted and ambitious as Wilson when it comes to the formulation of this as an aim for thought. Without any need to reorient the task of philosophy, Spencer finds consilience presupposed in the very notion of philosophy, which operates under the tacit implication that philosophy is completely unified knowledge. This is from first principles. After a preliminary definition of the task, First principle sets down the uh, axiomatic basis of knowledge. Uh, I quote, fundamental propositions or propositions not deducible from deeper ones and deriving from the very nature of rationality, taking as our data those components of our intelligence without which there cannot go on the mental processes implied by philosophizing. From these first principles, we pass to certain basic truths which for Spencer are the the indestructibility of matter. Remember that we are working here within a largely Newtonian paradigm predating Einstein and Bohr. And the continuity of motion, both derived from the more basic principle of Spencer's great principle is the persistence of force. A notion whose ultimate nature would have to be revised in our universe of quantum fluctuations. Be as it may, Spencer derives other basic principles of physics from these primary axioms. The persistence of the relations among forces, or the uniformity of law, 
as he calls it, is a necessary consequence of the fact that a force cannot arise out of nothing nor lapse into nothing. Mystery here. Present-day cosmology is still grappling with the limits set to these principles and to our universe by the Big Bang Theory, black holes and baby universes. But of course, those lay beyond the Newtonian paradigm of 19th century physics. The next step in reasoning is that forces which seem to contradict that principle and seem to be lost, dissipated, are transformed into their equivalents in other forces, or conversely, that forces which become manifest do so by the disappearance of pre-existing equivalent forces. A principle exemplified in astronomical physics, in common geological phenomena, and in biological processes. For instance, Spencer reminds us of the huge amount of biological or geological forces on Earth which result from the transformations of incoming solar radiation from the sun. Hmm? 